Hello, everyone, and welcome to History Speaks. Um, today, we have Executive Director of the Ruby Dee Row Museum, Daniel Johnson, here to talk to us about a little bit of the history of Ruby Dee Row. So we're very excited to have you here today. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you guys a little bit about the Ruby Dee Row. Um, as some of you know, it's, it's one of the oldest buildings in St. Joe, so I love talking about the history. Um, so to start off, we kind of have to look at the 1840s. Um, that's when Joseph Ribidoux obviously founded St. Joseph, Missouri, and that's when he really started the foundation of the building here. Uh, he laid the foundation around 1842, 43, from what we can tell, um, and built one small section of the building. Um, and then over the next 10 years, he expanded the building out to its full length um, through the 1850s. Uh, initially, that building was designed to be an apartment slash hotel slash hostel slash house. Um, and I say all those and I can explain each sections of those. Uh, he, it was an apartment because he would actually rent out the space to people going west. Um, if they were just heading straight across west, he would actually rent it to them for about a dollar a day to just stay in a room while they were waiting for their turn on the ferries to go west. Um, he also made it into kind of a hotel where in that aspect, it was kind of a layover. Um, if someone wanted to buy a piece of land in St. Joseph from him, they could stay there absolutely for free. And so it was kind of a hotel slash hostel for them where they were able to stay there long term while their house was being built. And along with that being a house, Joseph himself actually lived in the building uh, for about 10 to 15 years. Uh, so he kind of had it as all of those things. Um, as I mentioned, the building was built in three parts. Um, and if you do come into the building, you can actually find hard lines of where each part of the building was built. Uh, it, there's a, a brick wall that we actually had to send electrical through when we first fixed the building up in the 80s that uh, was not easy to get through because of it being a stolid brick wall. Um, throughout the building, it originally was built into about seven to 10 separate rooms. Uh, those numbers kind of fluctuate for how many we have because one part of the building, we don't have access to the original shape. So we don't know the exact numbers, but we're looking at about seven to 10 rooms for the entire building. Um, and then each of them would be generally one to two rooms, depending on who was staying with him. Uh, and what they needed access to. So if a large family was there, he'd give them two rooms. Um, they would all come with a fireplace or a more of a steamer pot uh, that he would supply all of the fuel for, along with uh, basic utensils and, and basic cooking supplies. Uh, after he did build the building, um, he did live here for 10 years, as I stated, with his sister Pelagi. And that happened in 1857. So the building was all finished by that time. And he moved into the back area of the room, um, which the museum does still have set up as his apartment area. Uh, during the summers here, though, it was kind of a fascinating. So instead of cooking inside, even, and even though every room does have its own fireplace and its own chimney, most of the cooking would be done in the back, what's now the backyard area. Uh, they would cook over big cooking pots. Um, and then along with that, basically the lighting would only be done through candles. Uh, and so it was a very dark kind of dreary place. Um, and until after the Civil War when kerosene ramps would be used, but you wouldn't see that as much in this area. Um, we did have, we have one room that does have a large fireplace um, that is still the original fireplace. And that location is actually, was known as a communal room. Basically you'd have a communal kitchen in there. People would stay in there during the, the cold summer and winter nights. Um, before they'd head to their rooms. Basically, Joe created a room where everyone could stay warm in a singular space. So Joe obviously used the space as an apartment for many years. The basement was actually a cold storage for meat. Um, the area that's accessible to the street now was actually completely underground all the way up to about 1930 or so. We've found pictures that show it completely underground. So it was a perfect cold storage location for meats and different products. Uh, when Joe did die in 1868, though, it did get passed to his son, Jules. 
Uh, and Jules used it as more of a true apartment building. Um, they would convert some of the walls, convert some of the building so that people could have larger and larger apartment spaces. Um, and they would rent that from him while they were using it. Uh, and over the years, it, it kept being used in that manner. Um, every few years, they would, people would redo the walls. They ended up being two, then three, then four bedroom apartments. And unfortunately, it kept going more and more in disarray. Um, throughout those middle years, uh, there's a number of stories. Um, and I know the, the library has a few of these stories about what happened to the museum and who was here. Um, we know of some stories of some nuns that were here in St. Joseph that stayed in the Ribadu Row area. Um, we know that there was a number of people through the history of the building that it, it just a number of great stories that you know we're, we're wanting to share. Um, and definitely I know the library has some of those stories. Uh, and then the building itself basically fell into full disarray. Uh, by about the 1970s, the building was a shell of what it used to be. Um, the beauty that it used to have was gone. Uh, it, it completely looked broken down, basically destroyed. Um, and at that point, the city actually condemned the building and was preparing to tear it down to build uh, Highway 229 and St. Joseph Avenue. Um, so in 1974, the Historical Society, led by uh, Mary Stauberboder, purchased the building with the plans to at least put it on the historical registry. Um, they weren't necessarily planning on fixing it up too much, but that was the initial plan. So they purchased it. They put on the historic registry, making it unable to be used to be destroyed by the city or by public funds. Um, but unfortunately, the original building hadn't fully been saved because in 1932, a portion of the building burned down, um, the largest portion of the building, in fact, uh, to the what's now where St. Joe Avenue is, used to be the additional half of the building um, that completely burned down in a fire in 1932. Um, in 1974, when they did save it, uh, they basically went through the building and checked its level of how well it stayed together. Uh, when they did go through it, they did find that only a single room had a actual floor that was savable. Um, the rest of the building was literally had to be completely destroyed. Um, and then the outsides were actually in danger of falling in. Um, the building was at that level of disarray. So the historical society decided to take up an eight year investiture to fix the building to the level where it was safe and usable. Um, at the same time, they did start an archeological dig in the back of the building. Uh, in, from that dig, they found a number of amazing artifacts, including uh, some, some whole jugs um, that had been tossed in a, one of the wells in the back. Uh, that was still in great condition, as well as uh, they found the space for seven to eight privies and a large barn that would actually be built on the back lot. Um, when the historical society took under the endeavor of restoring it, um, they basically tore the entire building down to the studs uh, and rebuilt every single room, fixed the floor in every single room, and brought everything up to what needed to be safe and uh, up to code. Um, and then finally, 1981, after about eight years of construction, the building was to a level where they could actually use it. Um, and so the Historical Society decided to open up the Rebuter Row Museum that we have today. Uh, the museum has been standing since 1981. Um, obviously, we still do have to do a lot of repairs on the building and get it to a level where it's, it's still obviously safe to be there. Um, and then since then, we've, of course, we keep working on it and the museum is now a functioning museum open to the public that allows them to experience that history along with what St. Joe is currently. We actually have a small excerpt here from a video that was made by Clyde Weeks um, at a celebration we did a couple of years ago for uh, Joseph Rebu's birthday. Um, Clyde was the executive director here for about 14 years um, and kind of set the standard for what executive directors did here.
It all started back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Bartlett Boder was president of the Histor Historical Society. He was also president of the uh, St. Joseph Museum. And uh, uh, a lot of things that were donated to one group didn't quite get there, but not that important. The main thing is they were preserved. Uh, one of the things that the Historical Society did back in those days was put signs on historical buildings. And one of the historical buildings was this building right here. It used to have a sign right out here on the end telling about it. Uh, they decided to buy a two-story building down in Market Square. The Market Square was going through a change. I heard a lot of the empty buildings and so forth. So there was a little two-story building there. It was the express office. It's where the Point Express rider stopped and picked up the mail before he went across the river to Elwood. Uh, the urban renewal people could see nothing historical about it. And so at midnight, they brought their wrecking ball in and knocked the fronts off of all the buildings on Market Square. Oh my God. So that was quite a blow to us. So then we tried to save the Jules Ruby Dew home, which was down on Edmund Street between 4th and 5th. Some of you may remember it as Blocks Furniture, right across from the Blocks Army Surplus Store. And here again, uh, this is where uh, Joseph Rimdew's funeral was held, in fact. And here again, Urban Reno could see nothing historic about it, and it's now a parking lot. So we were trying to save everything historic. We kind of became building huggers, you might say. You know, don't touch this, we don't touch that one. So uh, anyway, they finally told us, why don't you go up to Ruby Dew Row and say that you'll be completely out of the Urban Renewal District. We won't bother you at all. Well, so here we came. Uh, the building was in very much disrepair. Uh, and we were told that the big trucks going down the highway out here would jar it and shake it so that it would down and so forth. Well, it's still here. Uh, somehow, it was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. Now, that's before we even owned it. <coughs> so I don't know exactly how it got on the National Register. And a lot of people think that once it's on the National Register, it can't be torn down. Well, that's not true. It, can, it can't be torn down with federal monies. Otherwise, it could be flattened any time. Uh, there re was reportedly two owners of this building. One on the west end and one on the east end. Uh, I'm not too sure about that. And then another story I've heard that there were two ladies in the Historical Society who purchased the building. Uh, one was Mrs. Kimberlin, mm -hmm. and one was either B.B. Grimes or Mary Bowdoin. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, that could be fake news. I don't know. But uh, that's what I've heard. So we did purchase it in 1974. Uh, we had to convince the state to move their exit to I. 229 because it was supposed to come instead of going down to third street where it goes down straight down it was supposed to come and go right through here oh. take out this building so that's how, how close we came to losing it but because it was on the national register they couldn't use federal money for the highway to tear it down so we were able to save it now our problem was how to save it and how to fund it that's the big problem so i need the money for you to save so it was finally decided to make it a bicentennial project. And the government was giving out grants and so forth for uh, different bicentennial projects. So we got some grants, we also got some donations, and then they started the Ruby Dew Festival down there, which was the largest in Northwest Missouri at that time. This was before uh, Days of Trails West. And <clears throat> so we made money that way to help finance it. Uh, Gloria Ricks told me that uh, sometimes they would you know, completely stop work on the building because there's no money. So Mrs. Boder would get her ladies all together. She would say, we need help. Now you ladies go to your closets and your trunks and so forth. And they did and pulled out antique quilts and other antiques and so forth and sold them. Gave the money to the row here. So this has been a long, long struggle getting this building to where it is today. They did hire an architect. He was good at historic preservation. I believe he was from Kansas City, I'm not for sure. Um, but before they did that, they had to haul out 25 truckloads of trash out of this basement down here. Um, the building was gutted inside from one end to the other, uh, except for the solid brick walls you can see from one room to the other. Um, and 
and they actually had to tear down the entire north wall of what we now call the kitchen, the part with the porches, because it was bowed out and ready to fall. And they were afraid that it would fall on the people doing the archaeological digs down there. So they actually just knocked it down and built the back. And when they built the back, they turned the bricks around so that the prettier part of the bricks are now out that way. So that's why that part of the building looks so nice. <laughs> uh, the architect thinks that they were originally one room apartments and then finally were made into two room apartments. You can tell this by the way that the study and so forth was put in and doors were cut and things like that. Uh, there are still things, I just read this the other day, uh, information given out that there were seven two room apartments here. Well, that would be 14 rooms and we only have 10 rooms, so I can't quite figure that out. But, uh, we did have another section out west here. <laughs> My direction's right. He would have gone out into the highway right of way. Uh, I think there were three building, uh, three uh, sections there because there were three doorways and three steps and so forth. So that would make about six more rooms out there. Plus there were dormers in the attic, so we took maybe some attic rooms. So possibly this is where they're getting all their ones. Um, that part burned in the 1930s and was torn off. Um, this, but the state did hold up building the ramp for over a year because they wanted to do an archaeological dig, or had to do an archaeological dig. And uh, we were very unpopular with many of the people in the city of St. Joseph because they thought we were holding it up and it was the state that was holding it up. Uh, they found, uh, I think uh, the lady came from Jefferson City told me they had 30 boxes of artifacts down there. They gave us a whole case full of artifacts. And then we did an archaeological dig out here where the patio is because we had to take out about three feet of dirt. And uh, we found around 90 boxes, which are stored, or were stored back here. I guess it's still um, we did find either one or two original doors, which are these kind that had the long panels here. Uh, French style, and they made uh, duplicates of that. I never did find the original door, so it must have been gone by the time I got here. Almost every room has a door to the outside, uh, and every room does have a chimney. It has a fireplace, and we're not real sure uh, why he built one room with a fireplace. There's some talk that it was a communal kitchen. There's another talk that uh, somebody came and didn't have a stove, so they could live there. But nevertheless, we don't know. Uh, they did put in, um, make new windows, all out of walnut wood because the old ones were made out of walnut. Uh, like I said, they did an archaeological dig. They had a professor from Missouri University come. Uh, there were nine to ten toilets out there, three wells, and one cistern discovered. And of course, these were just full of uh, artifacts and things that people had thrown away. Uh, the reason we had three feet of dirt out there on the patio is that Black Snake Creek comes right back into these houses over here. And uh, before it was put into a sewer, it would flood. And of course, when it flooded, the water would come down here and fill up that. The only part that is actually original out on the patio is the brick floor under the porch. The other bricks that make up the patio came from the stockyards. Um, oh. When they first planned it, this was originally built, or supposed to be a neighborhood center where kids could come and play and do crafts and so forth. In fact, the very first room that you enter up there where the gift shop is and so forth was actually called the Arts and Crafts Room. They had a built-in sink and built-ins and so forth that they could use. Uh, the next room, which has a fancy floor in it now, was called the Archives Room. And in the room where they had the St. Joseph and the uh, things from uh, uh, <laughs> I might as well like yeah. Yeah. Um, the convent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, was called the boardroom, and plans just show a table with uh, seven or eight chairs around. That was it. Uh, somehow the ladies who were doing this gave Ruby Doo only two rooms. Now, we don't know how many rooms he had. The uh, books tell us that he died in the East Department of Ruby Doo Road. Our problem is we don't know how big the East Department was. It could have been two rooms, it could have been four rooms. 
who may have gone clear to the fireplace, who knows. Uh, when Jules Rubidoux sold the building in 1870, the ad advertised it as three apartments, period. Not three apartment buildings or anything, just three apartments. So that means this whole section here would be an apartment, the middle section would be an apartment, the part that burned would be an apartment. So here again, we don't know. They did do an analysis of the paint in the fireplace room, and that blue that you see there is the original color. Uh, they reproduced it. The furniture was donated or purchased from farm auctions because at farm auctions you find the old uh, rope beds and things like that that we have upstairs. And it seems like everyone must have gone out and bought chairs. <laughs> I never saw so many chairs back here in Omaha. Uh, you know, those wooden ones that uh, we used to use in those days. And finally the fire department came and said you can't have those old piled up there. So I tried to hang them from the ceiling. Well, we couldn't hang them from the ceiling because they were doing something to the sprinkler system. So anyway, we finally sold some of them, but we still kept some just in case we needed them. So, an awful lot of chairs. We do have an original piece of furniture from the Ruby Doos, uh, from Joseph Ruby Doo, and it's a rocking chair, which is in his bed. We also have uh, Sylvanie's um, love seat and chair and four side chairs. Uh, the only thing on display right now is the uh, armchair. Uh, the finally did open in 1981, in May of 1981. That was seven years after we purchased it, so it just shows you how long it took to, to get it on, to get it going. The porch was not yet built on when they did open it, so it was a big step down from the door, <laughs> if you were not here. Uh, but it was soon built on. The garden, of course, was planted, and originally our land stopped right at the back of the flower garden. That three corner piece out there was donated to us by the uh, highway department because we kept it mowed. And uh, they also put in the wooden fence along the highway to help stop the noise and so forth. And so you can see if it wasn't for uh, urban renewal, as much as I do not like urban renewal, yeah. if it wasn't for them, we'd be sitting right here in the middle of the highway all break mm -hmm. because this building would be long. Wow. So Ruby Dew has been saved for future generations and we hope it continues to be. Thank you. Right now the Ruby Dew Row is has a number of amazing exhibits that we're doing. Um, we actually just recently opened up a thing we're calling the Steps to the Past. Um, this exhibit is designed to give you the experience of being in 1840 and 50. Um, the back rooms are actually redesigned to have items and the feel of going west, the excitement you would have had going west, along with what your room would have looked like when you stayed here, of having it be a very tight, close-knit building where everyone was basically just on top of each other. Um, along with that, we are also, we have a number of exhibits that we've added in the main history room. Um, we have one that's called The Voices of the Trail. Uh, that are actually excerpts from women who came through St. Joe and newspaper articles from the 1840s talking about what it was like to be in St. Joseph at that time and the excitement of seeing miles and miles and miles of wagons lined up to go west from our launching point um, and, and the building itself being used as that launching point. Uh, so there's a lot of amazing information on that that you can check out. Um, and we are currently open on our kind of spring hours. So we're one to four Wednesday through Saturday. Um, but starting May 1st, we are going to be opening up 10 to four. Uh, so we'll have plenty of time for you guys to come see us still Wednesday through Saturday. Uh, but we do have a lot of exciting other exhibits that we can't officially announce yet, but they do kind of tie into this subject matter as well, where we're going to have some interesting items coming in that are going to kind of embrace that pioneer spirit and what this city was founded on uh, in the 1840s and 50s.